morning. In a few weeks, we're going to be celebrating Palm Sunday, praising Jesus who entered Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago, hailed then as the new king of Israel. Today, in our series on the eight days leading up to his passion, we're getting, we're getting a preview of what that day, that celebrated day, what that day meant then and what it means to us today. He is a humble king who enters into our lives today offering to take away our sins if we will receive him. Last week we saw how Jesus dinner party in Bethany at the home of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. And we, we saw how Mary came into the dining room and anointed him with precious perfumed oil, oil that was worth perhaps in our terms today forty-five to $100,000 right there all dumped out on one person. She did it in gratitude for what he had done for them, for their family. You see, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus said of her act, she has done a beautiful thing to me. Have you ever done a beautiful thing for the Lord? An extravagant act of gratitude? Given him your all? Now, Jesus also said something at that party that probably no one else was even thinking about. <coughs> he said, She has anointed my body beforehand for my burial. Why? Why at this, this joyous dinner party would anybody? be thinking about burial. He knew, of course, what was to come, that he would challenge the authorities, religious and political, and would suffer for it. But his suffering had a purpose. For by his death, he would redeem humanity from its sinful way. <coughs> and yet, no one else at that party, understood what he was about to do. <coughs> Nor did they fully understand who he is. <coughs> so I thought I'd try something different this week. <coughs> and sorry, so far it's not working. I come up to this point in the third, third, third time around, you'd think I'd be better at this sermon, but it just causes me to cough. So after that party in Bethany, and after the day of rest, that would be Saturday, the Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples <coughs> headed into town, into Jerusalem. <coughs> While they were in the village on the way there, Bethphage, a little, little place between Bethany and Jerusalem, he sent two of his disciples to find the donkey and her colt and instructed them to bring them back to him. <coughs> they did that. And he, he said to his disciples, if the owner asks you, where are you taking these animals? Just say to them, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send them back. So evidently the owner knew of these arrangements or knew who Jesus was, and he was supportive of him. Now I need to tell you that all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell about this triumphal entry. It is that significant that it's not left out by any of them. And as you read this story, or at least as I read the stories, there's one impression that stands out. It seems to me that Jesus is in complete control of all the events on that day. Now, he knew that the crowds were fickle. 
I mean, people can be enthusiastic about something one day and then they're distracted to something else the next day. He knew that the leaders in Jerusalem were plotting against him. He knew that the cheers of the crowd could be jeers later in the week. He knew on Sunday (coughs) probably what was going to happen on Friday. He knew the cross lay directly in his path. (coughs) (coughs) And yet, he went to Jerusalem anyhow. You know, he could have stayed in Bethany nice and comfortable with his um, family of friends, celebrated Passover there with his disciples, it would have been fine. But he chose to go into Jerusalem facing all of that that was before him. (coughs) So it's Sunday morning now, five days before the Passover. The historian Flavius Josephus, who wrote uh, the history of the Jews and the Jewish wars, um, estimated that There could be up to 3 million people coming to Jerusalem for Passover from all around the Mediterranean world. Now, that's an astounding number of people. What's Bakersfield? Half a million? I can't imagine 3 million people coming to Jerusalem. Not that big a place. But the point is, there were huge crowds everywhere. People were (coughs) jam-packed. Everyone who was anyone in Judaism showed up in Jerusalem for the Passover. So in such an atmosphere of festive anticipation, stories spread like wildfire. The raising of Lazarus. You think that was kept secret? No, it was told and retold throughout the city. People were abuzz with the stories of this Jesus from Nazareth uh, who worked miracles, who, who taught wonderful things, and he didn't teach like the Pharisees and the uh, scribes, there was something about him. He had a way with people and with God. <clears throat> and people began to talk, wondering if this Jesus would come into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Everybody also knew that there was tension between Jesus and the temple leaders. Added to that was the general political ferment. There were the Pharisees who patiently endured the Roman rule, those foreigners who had conquered Israel. And then there were the zealots who didn't patiently endure anything, especially the hated Romans. Then there were the Sadducees who ran the temple complex and cooperated with the Romans, probably to secure their own coveted elite positions. And then there were the Romans themselves and their two key rulers. There was the governor, Pontius Pilate, who kept his home and headquarters down at Caesarea by the sea because he didn't like going to Jerusalem because it was hot and dusty and full of people he didn't like, namely Jews. And then there was Herod Antipas, who was called, quote-unquote, the king of of Israel or the king of the Jews, but he had gotten his position through the Romans by bribing and manipulating his way to an appointment as king of the Jews, but he wasn't even Jewish. So the crowd cheered Jesus as the rightful king who would free them from Rome's oppression. They chanted, Hosanna! A Hebrew word meaning, save us now, save us now. Well, when you chant that about someone who's coming into town with big crowds, it's, it's the chant that was chanted for the king of Israel. They, they chanted psalms as well. We, we used one of them earlier as a response of Psalm 118. <clears throat> These are royal psalms that they chanted. They were about the king going up to the temple. And they called him son of David. David was Israel's most renowned, beloved king of all. And to call Jesus son of David would be like saying, here's the true guy. 
Here's the real one. God sent this Savior to us. They waved palm branches. Some of them laid their cloaks on the ground, it said. You know, the cloak might be the most expensive article of clothing that a guy had. But there's one thing in all of this that doesn't seem to fit. Did you notice? It's the donkey. A conquering hero, a king, would ride in on a stallion or a chariot. This, this Jesus coming in on a donkey, actually the colt of a donkey, I don't know, it would be like the Queen of England pulling up to Buckingham Palace on a moped. I mean, just not fitting. Jesus could hardly have chosen a more unlikely way to present himself to the nation and to the world. You know, it's, it's not hard to imagine that the Romans who were watching this were laughing, laughing at this spectacle. Here's this pauper king riding on a borrowed donkey's colt, his saddle a makeshift layer of dirty cloaks, attended by an unruly, undisciplined mob whose only weapons were palm branches. He didn't look much like a king that day. And that explains, I suppose, why the Romans, who didn't like unruly crowds, maybe it explains why they sat idly by on this Sunday while tens of thousands of people flocked to see Jesus. From their point of view, the whole thing looked like a joke. A real king. Now, a real king would ride a war stallion or a chariot. But that was the whole point here. He's a king, but he's not like any king they have ever seen. Jesus knew who he was. The king. King of kings. And he knew the scriptures. Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, Daughter Jerusalem, see, see, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The prince of peace did not arrive on a stallion or a chariot of war. He did not come in earthly splendor or to reign in earthly power. He came in poverty, not wealth. He came in meekness, not in grandeur. He came not to slay Israel's enemies, but to give life to all humanity. The triumphal entry was an acted parable in which Jesus was sending a clear message to the nation. See, I am your king, but I'm not the king you were expecting. Up to this time, he had avoided any public declaration of his messiahship. But today was the day of Jesus' self-declaration. The foal of a donkey, the colt of a donkey. No one had ever ridden on this little animal before. Here's Jesus riding on the colt. Only unused animals could be used for sacrifice or sacred purposes. Jesus sat upon a colt that had never before been ridden on, entering Jerusalem as their Messiah and King, who was the first priest, even as he became the sacrificial lamb of Passover. This was the beginning of his road to the ultimate sacrifice. And we, we might just pause here and ask ourselves, am I willing 
to sacrifice for him something in him when he sacrificed all for me. Because he was a king like no other king, his coronation was like no other coronation. His kingdom is not of this world. In a very real sense, he was calling into question all earthly kingdoms. He was putting on notice to all of those in the establishment that his kingdom was now arriving. His kingdom is a counterpoint to all earthly kingdoms. For he is the humble king. More than laying down a cloak for someone, he laid down his life for all. Jesus, right into Jerusalem on this Sunday, was the establishment of his heavenly kingdom. So, so what what would this unlikely king accomplish? Let's be clear. He came to conquer. But he came to conquer two things that no other king, no general, no power on earth could ever conquer, no matter how strong they are or how hard they tried. He came to conquer sin and death and thereby to triumph over guilt and shame. The sin in our nature is that desire to turn away from God, believing that we can do it better, or that we can do it freer, to turn away from the source of life. And as people turn away from God, their problems pile up. And the guilt and the shame nags away all the fun in it. How will he conquer sin and death, guilt and shame? Through humility. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And, and being found in appearance as a man... <coughs> He humble, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Even to the point of dying on, on a cross, the most shameful punishment there was. He humbled himself before all in order to take the penalty of sin for all, that he might redeem all, thereby conquering all sin that leads to death. His ultimate defeat of our ultimate enemy came from his sacrifice for us on the cross. And that's why God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. He did more than lay down a cloak for us to cover the dirt of sin that we walk through every day. He laid down his life to wash it away forever. And he was commissioned to be just such a king. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. That's oppressed by the devil, the keeper of the king's the keeper of, of the bondage of sin by their cultivated detractors because of their heartfelt passion for the salvation in Christ that they had experienced. And they sang about it and they shouted it. Sometimes they were called the shouting Methodists. They expected and experienced supernatural manifestations of God's power in their lives. And that's the only power that can cleanse us of sin, supernatural power. Where are we today? Where are we today? I think a lot of us have become quite comfortable 
in our routines. That there isn't much room for Holy Spirit supernatural power. Maybe some of us are educated beyond our level of obedience. So we have difficulty walking in the Spirit. Are we afraid of Holy Spirit action in our lives? Or have we plumbed the depths of our souls to find that true and deep darkness in us that, that only He can bring light to? In church, we've come to expect our leaders to be humble yet strong, self-giving but not self-righteous, following the model of Jesus. And this is a good thing, as every Christian, whether leader or not, should be seeking to be more like Jesus. But, but what happens when, when Christian leaders are not humble or abuse their power? What, measure, uh, what message do we give to our neighbors when we do not model our behavior after Jesus? Long ago, St. Augustine wrote, if you plan to build high houses of virtues, you must first lay deep foundations of humility. In a few weeks, we'll celebrate Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Let us do so, fully knowing who he really is and what his kingdom really means for us. If Jesus is king, then he must be king over all aspects of our lives. Our tongues, our bodies, our time, our money, our work, our leisure, our families. And if he is not king over all, he is not king at all. St. Paul went on to write in his letter to the Philippians, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Let that be so among us. For when this is so, the kingdom of God, his kingdom, comes into our lives and it ripples out to everyone around us. May it be so. Amen.